All right, so uh, hi everybody. People hi, still buddy. rolling in. Come on, <laughs> talking about air gaps, it's gonna be fun. All right, we'll get started. So hello everybody, my name is Mike Ferris from Stark and Wayne. And I'm Vincent White from Agile Defense. I am with Agile Defense. I just like Stark and Wayne so much, so I was supporting them today. He likes the shirts so <laughs> right. much, so he's supporting the shirts. Just today. want to make sure you know Agile Defense is in the house. <laughs> yeah. All right, and so today we're going to be talking about air gapping. And uh, so Vince and I have actually worked on uh, a project together recently where our two companies came together to work in an air gapped environment. And so we're going to be talking about some of the pitfalls we faced with installing PCF or Cloud Foundry in general, or really any PaaS in general in that kind of environment and providing, still being able to provide the experience that users expect from Cloud Foundry uh, in that air gapped environment. And if you don't know what air-gapped environment is, we'll talk about that in a second. So next slide. Okay, so what is an air-gap? It is the 21st century moat. If you're in an air-gap network, you are in that castle, and you can't, uh, nobody can get into the castle, nobody can get out. I don't know if there's a drawbridge here, but uh, no bridges in an air-gapped environment. Can't get in, can't get out to the, to the internet. And so uh, a way more boring diagram with zero castles is right here, where you see the internet at the top, and when you air-gap the environment, next slide. Boom, no internet. Everybody clear? <laughs> internet? No. Internet? No. <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> um, okay, so. So what is our, what are is organizations use our gaps? Um, okay. So basically it is to protect us from internal and external hackers um, or, um, yeah. sorry about that, okay. Yeah. All right, so basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically um, protecting the environment from internal or external hackers. Right, where obviously external hackers are people trying to get in, trying to uh, compromise your system, trying to take advantage of ports that are open to the internet that you might not know are open to the internet, or you might not know have a vulnerability where they can get in, get root access to, start doing um, funky stuff. And obviously the best way to make sure nobody gets in is make sure nobody has physical access in the first place. Um, and then internal, by internal hackers, we're just talking about people in your organization, rogue employees that might want to install software that has not been deemed uh, okay by the organization and just rogue employees in general that might compromise your network by thinking they're smarter than everyone and installing whatever they want. And so obviously there's uh, a lot of ben the benefits that we just talked about, but with any benefits, obviously there come cons. And the big cons with installing a PaaS, especially like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes in one of these environments, is that one, all those binaries that you uh, use to install Kubernetes and all the documentation, everything is tailored towards an environment. Typically, all the detail in the documentation is about an environment where you have access to the internet. All the installation patterns are going to uh, go and grab things from the internet, pull them down. And so when you don't have access to the internet, you are going to hit some complications that we're going to talk about that will ultimately slow you down. That's a big problem that we want to uh, show you in this presentation how to solve, how to not get slowed down too much by an air gapped environment. And so uh, for developers, obviously there's implications on every engineer using uh, every software engineer within an organization. So for developers, the implications are going to be that their apps obviously cannot use the internet. So don't write your apps to use the internet. <laughs> Pretty simple. And then also for building your apps, uh, a lot of, especially like in Cloud Foundry, for example, you use build packs. And a lot of those build packs, they actually go out and they'll download, uh, if it's the Java build pack, it'll download jars that you need. A lot of things that you need for the build process will come from the internet. So in that case, you want to use things like offline build packs. Basically, like I said, with uh, the running of the apps, don't make your app use the internet. Uh, with the building of the app, don't make the building of the app use the internet. But in this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the operators. So uh, let's go to that. And uh, we might be biased as operators, but here's the uh, how complicated air gapping makes the developers' lives. And then here's how complicated it makes the operators' lives. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. with those complications, right, so it comes installation complication for us as whatever role that you may be playing in on the, on the platform team, uh, from the DevOps team to engineers, um, because one, you're talking about now, all right, what, like, um, like we stated earlier, what installations can we download that we that needs all of the supporting detail or supporting 
um, softwares or installations to map that out and then from an engineer level and then take that over to the air gap environment. So like that within itself is a complication because as we know, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to it. Um, upgrade. So after you have an insula uh, platform up, uh, installed and upgrade, I mean uh, ins installed, you at some point in time, of course, you want to look at upgrade. So now, your whatever role you play, of course, it goes back to understanding what pieces are needed to upgrade, making sure that though it falls in the guidelines and the protocols that um, is necessary in whatever environment or situation that you're in. And like Mike stated earlier, no use of the external services. So that those external services are uh, GitHub for for repositories, um, Harbor, Docker, any of those type external services. Now you have to engineer. Okay, we got to build this on the uh, air gap side to make sure that we can emulate the same process or scenario on the non air gap side. Right, and we uh, want to just go back one slide. I just want to. Sorry. We just called that out specifically because that obviously it complicates your life in uh, when you're doing installation or upgrades. You're pulling down from external services. For example, with PCF, you pull down from PivNet. Uh, you'll pull down the Docker uh, containers you need for your concourse pipelines from Docker Hub, and you can't access those. Another reason that might complicate your life is depending on how many hats you wear as an operator or on the infrastructure side of things, your developers who now also can't use those external services might be coming to you to replace, to give them a uh, alternative to use those solutions. So it can kind of have a double whammy effect of uh, increasing your responsibilities as an operator. And so let's run through an example of, uh, so with installation of PCF, uh, obviously Pivotal ships uh, concourse pipelines and so those will install your PCF on an IaaS and it's going to, if you're, if you're not air-gapped, it's going, those pipelines are going to be grabbing uh, artifacts you need from PivNet, it's going to be grabbing the Docker, Docker containers you need from Docker Hub, it's going to be grabbing the pipeline tasks from GitHub, your life's going to be easy, it's going to be great, except, oh wait, we're air-gapped, we can't talk to any of those. So what you instead need to do for installation is you need to have, like we mentioned, internal services to match each one of those. An internal service corresponding to each of the external services that you can no longer talk to. So in this case, you'll have an internal blob storage where you'll put with the things that would typically be in PivNet. And so that can be anything like Minio, any typically S3 compatible blob storage is uh, typically your go-to. Minio, Ceph if you're on uh, OpenStack, anything will do. And then, so to uh, match Docker Hub, you'll have an internal Docker registry. Uh, VM Harbor, VMware Harbor is an uh, example of that. And then for to match GitHub or whatever external uh, Git repository you were using, you'll instead have your own internal one that, like Vince mentioned, now you have to build out all these services and that is increasing your responsibilities as an operator. And, uh, and just to add to what it is, like I stated earlier, this piece, right, is a part where, okay, now I, from whatever hat, ideally the engineer, we have to come in and put this together simply because if to be to be effective you want it done the right way as much as possible the first time because there's a lot of going back and forth so the engineering piece will definitely be tremendous a tremendous help to that yeah and so um so obviously you're you're wondering you're thinking okay this is great we've got these uh We've got these services that magically contain all the blobs we need. We've got a Docker registry that magically contains the Docker containers we need. This diagram kind of implies that everything's all set to go and we just got to build these, uh, but we actually have to populate them with the things we need. So how do you get the things that are typically in PivNet into your internal blob storage if you're in an air-gapped environment? So the best practice, and you'll see there, is an asterisk next to, the, next to that best because this might, you, you might, uh, go to your security team and start the sentence to say, hey, we might want to have a D, and they'll say, no, you can't do that. So best obviously depends on the environment you're in, on uh, what kind of regulations your security team is imposing on you. And so uh, this is best as in it's going to make the operator's lives easier, but it might just not be feasible within your organization. So it really depends on the organization. But anyway, so the best uh, practice for making your life easiest as an operator is to, be, is to have a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, which basically ends up being one VM or a couple VMs that are whitelisted on the network and can talk to the internet, but can also talk to the air gap. And so what you would do is run a concourse pipeline or whatever your CI is, 
and specifically have uh, a YAML file, a YAML file defining your pipeline that calls out each resource that you need to grab from where it needs to be grabbed from, which version you need to grab, and then where you need to put it into your uh, internal services. And this makes your life really easier than the alternative, which we'll get to, because now you have, in addition to that pipeline being the thing that actually does uh, all of the grabbing for you, it also it ends up being documentation of which resources, which versions of which resources are in your system. And so you've just got a nice list that you can then modify and run later um, if you need to get a new version. And so that's the best practice. Worst practice. <laughs> so, worst practice. <laughs> um, worst practice. So, basically, it is we're walking from one building to go to another building that has internet access <laughs> to burn our binaries, artifacts, um, build packs, whatever those are, to a DVD. So, as we're walking, we're making sure that we have a case of CDs or DVDs in our hand and we're going over to the other area to, um, to burn what we need. So in adding to that, you find out, um, so you go there, you, 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 you download whatever binary or bill pack you have, and you put it on a disk, you get back, and you're ready to go. You know you got those binaries on that disk. You saw it before you left, um, they're all there. And you get over and you start pushing those bill packs um, or uploading those uh, binaries and you find out that it's corrupt. <laughs> Completely um, hypothetical. This didn't happen to us hundreds of times. <laughs> <laughs> so you find out they're corrupt. So um, you, you're trying to figure out now, and we literally sat and did this big, like deep diving. We know the files are there. Like maybe something is wrong in the file. So we're changing, you know, different things in those in that in that YAML file or in that. Um, in that bill pack, and it's just like, oh no, okay. So we find out that it's corrupt. So now we are marching back across the street to put that same file, that same binary or bill pack on the disc, in the DVD, to make sure that it's there. And then we're coming back and trying to, basically, it's a, it's a rinse and repeat type thing, right? Till we get the right one. So ideally, what you would want to have, or did you have before I yeah, go to the Okay. Yeah, if you get one thing out of this entire presentation, this would be it. Yeah. <laughs> um, just in situ if you find yourself in a situation like this where you have to be going manu uh, somewhat manually or completely manually going and downloading all the resources that you're going to need for your system, uh, don't wing it. Plan ahead and think about which binaries you're going to need because it's going to make your life a lot easier and it's going to make you way more effective as an operations uh, team and if you are winging it like I said your developers are going to notice eventually and because you're going to be moving very slowly and you're going to kind of your team's kind of going to be a dumpster fire um, so plan ahead about which binaries you need make a list of all them beforehand it's an easy it's a harder t harder said than done but uh, it will definitely make your life easier that's something that me and Vince learned on the job <laughs> yeah I think the other piece to add too is just making sure like you have those necessary parties in there to plan ahead like developers do, if if you're not you know developers on the developer side is making sure hey you know can you sit with us and we do our, our whiteboard on um, pieces that you guys need or have used in the past so we can factor all of that in because now what you're doing is making sure that you have the supporting tiles and those sort of things to make sure that those developers are able to be um, impactful in what they're doing as well and so uh, so as every operations person knows, once you've installed the platform, your job's done. <laughs> You're good. Good to go. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and uh, so obviously that's not true. You still need to maintain the platform. You still need to upgrade the platform. And you want to be doing this in a, uh, a regular cadence and providing functionality that, oper that developers are requesting and being able to do that in a timely manner. And so in order to do that properly, it's going to go back to exactly what I just said. If in the best case, you've got your uh, pipeline defined in a YAML file where you're just changing which resources you need in that YAML file and uh, you run the pipeline, it grabs them down and you're good to go and you've still got that YAML file defining nicely every single resource that you're pulling into the system. Um, and then in the worst case, where you've got to walk across the parking lot with the DVD, come back, stand in line maybe, um, planning is going to be everything in having a uh, good 
regular upgrade cadence and velocity, and being able to provide requested features to your developers. Yeah. And so uh, let's talk about, Vince and I each have uh, our own respective experiences outside of our experience together on that one contract. Um, so I've worked in, I've, I've had a lot of experience working in situations where the best practice that we talked about was allowed. And so we would have, like I mentioned, that pipeline that was just defining everything that we needed to pull down. And once we had that pipeline defined and every, everybody on the team was aware of how that pipeline worked and what you needed to do if you wanted to upgrade and get a new, get a new version of a binary and, uh, or add a new version and who you needed to talk to in order to make sure that, that those whitelisted VMs in that pipeline were within the constraints of your security team and you weren't going to get yelled at. Once all that was uh, taken care of up front, the operations team weren't slowed down very, very much, if at all, by the air gap. And so, like I, I, that's why I say it's the best case if your uh, organization will allow that kind of setup. And um, so, yeah, I've been on a couple of uh, engagements where that kind of setup has been allowed, and it's like I said, it hasn't slowed us down too heavily, and it's allowed us to do installations in a timely manner without uh, looking up, without us looking like a dumpster fire, and do upgrades in a timely manner, and be able to. Uh, stay up to date with versions of the platform as it comes out and being able to provide functionality as it's requested by users. And so Vince is in a little bit of a, uh, has been in a different situation a couple of times and so he can talk about that. Yeah, I mean it's, it's, it's somewhat similar, it's just um, some more, there's added pieces like for us um, in an air gap environment you have to have from top down ATOs, right? Um, you have to have, there's a number of things that you have to have. I won't go through that list because it's long. Um, but there's a lot of compliance that you have to ensure that you're staying inside of. Um, so planning is, like you said, it's, it's definitely like, that's like number one. Like if you, the planning piece can make the, our, our installation in a, in a, um, in an air gap environment um, much smoother. Um, and when you have the right parties and people um, that's a part of that. For us, in our environment, we had um, different people that we reached out to that helped um, in different perspectives to help make our planning um, a little bit easier. Um, and I'm talking about from, from the installation piece, from the security piece, from the uh, 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 compliance piece, from uh, vulnerabilities, from all of those aspects. Like, we had different people we could reach out to to make sure that we were uh, inside of that arena to to get past the hurdles of when we started on our own. So what Mike was talking about earlier is, you know, going back and forth. Um, and I just paint like a little small picture of, um, you know, points that are not high is, you know, you start out with this offline bill pack and you find out there's other pieces that you need of that offline bill pack um, to make that bill pack work. So if you're if you're talking with somebody like Mike that knows the, the outside pieces of what makes that bill pack work, it's like, okay, hey, let me jot this down. We'll, get, we'll, we'll put a list together so that when we walk over, we can have as much as as much as we can get on those DVDs um, or whatever and bring it back over and, um, and be successful in just deploying that offline uh, or pushing that offline bill pack right. so that we could be over help. Yeah, those trips start to add up if you're uh, <laughs> winging it and not planning ahead yeah. and coming back every time and saying, okay, now we need something else. Okay. Yep. In that case, you might want to hire an intern to do it for you. <laughs> um, and just a uh, side note about each of our respective experiences. My experiences where we are allowed to use those, uh, that best practice that I talk about with having a pipeline do this for you and uh, basically self-documenting all the resources that you've pulled in via YAML file that also doubles as your pipeline that does it for you. Uh, that tends to be, those have tended to be in financial uh, institutions and whereas Vince's experience with completely not being able to do that, not even be, being able to finish the sentence asking for, uh, asking for permission to do that, those have tended to be in uh, more defense, the defense world of side of things. So if you, so if you are a consultant who might be doing defense type stuff in the future, or uh, or you are in the defense sector, and you're thinking about doing platforms, I would definitely recommend 
heavily investing yourself in, in your team in planning ahead with which binaries you're going to need and knowing that ahead of time. Obviously, it depends on the platform that you're installing, the flavor of the platform, everything uh, to know what those to know what those are. And uh, but yeah, that's that, I'd say that was that would be my one big takeaway from this presentation. If there's any planning ahead and not not trying to wing it, because Vince, like like we've said, Vince and I did that at first and it didn't go well. We had to uh, kind of pivot and think of something better. Think of a better way to do it. The entire in installation, really, like we were pivoting, right? You know, with our team, we were right. pivoting we to, like through the entire situation. Making but, a better process really made all the difference towards yeah. our uh, velocity as an operations team and being able to actually provide functionality to developers. And to add what Mike was saying about if you're a consultant, it's just uh, definitely sitting down with the um, the DevOps team or whatever team, um, just to understand the restraints up front that they are dealing with, so you can. That can be a, a factor factored into your solution um, or installation plan as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know which things to download. Yep. I'll, I'll just <laughs> planning ahead. Yep. Because the software is not going to do it for you in this case. Um, so yeah, is, that is our presentation that on air gaps and installing platforms. Does anybody have any questions? We'd be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that would be, it obviously depends on the solution that you're using to, that's actually doing the looking. But for example, in Concourse, it's just a matter of um, changing the YAML file to, changing the URL in the YAML file, maybe some, some of the parameters, if it's a completely different kind of service, how the credentials are being passed and whatnot. But um, I've never used Jenkins or anything like that, or any uh, most other CI things, but I can't, uh, I'd imagine it's really similar, just changing the URL of where that's pointing to. Most of, them, most of them seem to be uh, pretty plug and play at this point where you can just uh, interact with different services by just changing a URL, maybe changing some of the parameters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Ide ideally. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, so it depends on the environment, obviously. Some. Yeah, some environments, the uh, proxies typically come into play in that DMZ type of environment where you do have access to the internet, but it needs to go through something that might be regulating your traffic, checking uh, HTTP headers, things like that. And um, typically the biggest problem is that I've, that I've run into with proxies in an environment like that is forgetting that the proxy is there and forgetting that you're talking to the proxy and uh, thinking that you're talking to something else and trying to decode the error message as if you're talking to something else but forgetting that the proxy is there. So um, do you have a, is, does that answer your question? Do you have a more specific like... Um, I'm curious if I didn't see it as a pattern. Yeah, I, I got you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Typically in that DMZ pattern that I talked about, there would be a proxy there, yeah, correct. And, yeah, I think just to add like in a defense where like most of the time if you're si sitting in that DM the DMZ you're pretty much good unless you come across some um, pieces that are hard coded um, if they're not hard coded you should be pretty much good as far as like any traffic going in and out or through that DMZ um, that's in the defense side like I said mo most of the time yeah Yeah, good question. So obviously it really depends on the organization. Um, but for, so for a, you're talking for a security team to vet those and say, okay, yeah, you can pull these in. It can really, I think the minimum I've seen it take is a week. And um, the most I've seen it take is longer than the engagement I was on, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're one of those. <laughs> We're still waiting. <laughs> I'll check my email after this and see what's going on. We didn't email you. <laughs> yeah, but it can vary. But that's definitely a very, very good point. And that is another thing that can greatly influence the speed at which you can deliver to your developers. And so um, getting on the same page with your security team as far as we are trying to 
uh, be an agile team that is delivering functionality iteratively to our developers and we're going to need, this is not going to be a one and done thing where we come to you and say, hey, is this good? We need to come back and say, hey, is this good too? The, the next version of that or the next version of your Docker image and being able to do that iteratively, yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, getting on the same page with your security team about the iterative fashion at which you plan to work is very important and can either uh, facilitate or definitely uh, slow down your process as a operations team. To add to that too is getting with the CM because that, they would, configuration manager, like they would definitely be over help because you can ensure that versions of and versions before or after um, are, are, has been vetted mm -hmm. and, and good to go. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point, um, or a good question. Um, so you could have. I've seen a lot of organizations have like a lab where you can turn on and off an air gap functionality, so you can pull everything in that you uh, that you need via the typical way. Turn off the environment and make sure that using those binaries that you've just pulled in, everything runs properly, and then you can say, yeah, from there. We're good to go. We're good. We can uh, figure that we're going to be good to go once we move that into an actual air gapped environment. That's what we're doing. Um, that's it's going to be a, a big help. Um, Agile defense. They're our lab, um, and so it's a implementation. It's a duplication of what we have in the air gap, what is needed in the air gap, and then Agile lab is. What, the same thing, it reflects the same, it mirrors the same. Mm -hmm. So that, that testing and that um, break, and fi break and fix piece will be done in that lab and then we can push it over. Yeah, being able to, having that lab uh, such that you as an operations team can toggle that air gappedness, that would be imperative towards uh, the testing of it. Otherwise, you're going to be going back to the same security that's air gapping your actual environment and it's going to be, end up probably being just as slow. Um, so yeah, good question, thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> What's you got? Uh, so you can have the two. So you can have the mm -hmm. easy and not easy. The other one has a scenario where you can use Concourse in another environment to do all of that pulling down, but instead of putting it into the proper place to do the air app, you just throw it into a lob so that you can run directly to a DVD and then take that over. So, so you're still automating the Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would definitely be an ideal scenario. In the so, in the specific scenario that Vince and I worked in, that would not have been possible because the um, computers in the place that we were working on they were Windows machines, and if we said, "Hey, can we install Concourse here?" they'd be like, "What?" Um, or any CI engine, and it would have been just a no, complete no-go right from the start. But yeah, that would definitely be another uh, ideal scenario, obviously depending on your organization. Good point. Is that a question? <laughs> no. All right, I think we're good. Thank you for coming, everybody.